Before the raid, Kang prepared to commune with his queen. He removed a felt bag from his locker and carefully poured out its contents on the floor. These included a candle, a small pot of gray powder, and a holy symbol of the Dark Queen. Except the holy symbol wasn't there. Kang scratched his head. He turned the bag inside out. No symbol. Lifting the bag to his nose, he sniffed. His snout wrinkled. Dwarf! Some dwarf had been inside his footlocker, had stolen his holy symbol. Kang growled. He might have known. His friendly feelings toward them vanished. His sole comfort was the thought of what Takesis would do to the wretched thief who had dared laid hands on her icon. Kang stomped about, feeling and kicking things for a bit. He needed that holy symbol. How could he approach his queen without it? His rampage carried him to the stand on which he kept his armor. He paused. There on his breastplate was a medallion with the queen's symbol, the five-headed dragon. The medallion merely marked his rank as commander. It hadn't been blessed by the dark clerics as had his other symbol. However, on many occasions it had been splashed by the blood of her dark majesty's enemies. Kang pried the symbol off the breastplate, spent a few moments polishing it, then carried it over to his makeshift altar. He lit the candle and chanted a prayer to the queen to gain her attention. Next, he sprinkled a pinch of the gray powder over the fire. The flame flared. Blue sparkles burst in front of Kang, dazzling his eyes. He continued to intone the holy prayers. A bang at the door jolted Kang from his hypnotic state. It was time for the raid. The two moons were cresting Mount Celeboon, where Selquist, Augur, Pestle, and Mortar set off their journey to Thorban. Selquist had specifically picked this night to depart, suspecting that the Draconians were going to raid their town. It would be the perfect diversion. Morthane and the rest of the dwarves would be so busy fighting off the attack, they wouldn't even notice the little party of four dwarves creeping off into the night. Nearing the end of the street, Selquist called a halt. Confound it! There's two sentries sitting on the far end of the fence. Gilbert's one of them, so I'm not too worried. He makes Augur here look intelligent. We could try another way, but we've lost enough time as it is. The Dracos are bound to hit soon. We'll chance it. Keep low and keep quiet. The three dwarves followed Selquist through a small apple orchard across from the last house. As they were coming out the far side, a voice caused them to stop in their tracks. Hello, called out Gilbert nervously. He slid off the fence post. His hand fumbled for the axe at his belt. Who? Who's there? May rocks fry his head, Selquist cursed. He stood up, gave a casual wave. Oh, is that you, Gilbert? Yes, it's me, Gilbert said, suspicious. Who, who are you? Selquist, you ninny. You know Arger, Mordor, and Pestle? Sure. Hi, guys, Gilbert waved. Hi, Gilbert, the four said solemnly, waving back. What are you doing out there, Gilbert asked. Picnic, said Selquist. In the dark? Gilbert was doubtful. Best time, Selquist said. No flies. Gilbert thought this over. Yes, but the draconians are coming. We brought enough food for everyone. Well, gotta be going. <laughs> See you, Gilbert. They waved goodbye and trotted off down the road. The draconians loped across the valley, the entire troop running in formation, taking the pace at an easy jog. When the line of trees marking the dwarven village came into sight, the second squadron, led by Ehrlich, advanced. As second in command, Slith had been assigned to accompany the second squadron. The draconians advanced slowly and silently across the open plain leading to the tree line at the east edge of the town. Slith suddenly flopped onto his belly and flattened himself on the ground. Down, he ordered in a harsh whisper, motioning with his hand. The squadron that was spread out behind him immediately crouched down on their haunches, immobile as boulders. Cautiously, Slith raised his head. At first, he thought he was hearing things. But then the voice speaking Dwarven spoke again. Oh, is that you, Gilbert? Yes, it's me, another dwarf answered. Who are you? Selquist, you ninny. You know Arger, Mortar, and Pestle. The dwarves continued talking. Slith squirmed around on his belly. Spotting Ehrlich, Slith motioned the squadron leader forward. Ehrlich slithered up to join the Sivak. Picnic, one of the dwarves was saying. This is damn odd, Slith whispered. What do you think these fool dwarves are doing? roaming around out here at this time of night. Ehrlich shook his head. Looks to me like they're leaving town. They're all wearing packs. Do you think they saw us? I don't know, Slith said, worried. I don't think so. They would have raised the alarm by now. The Draconians hunkered down, waited in tense silence. The four dwarves never looked in the Draconians' direction. 
Waving to the sentry on the fence, the four disappeared into the night. You know, said Slith, I think those sneaky little bastards might be going to raid us. I'll take four of your boys and follow them. You carry on with the raid. Yearly crept back to the squadron. Four draconians leapt up, ran forward to join Slith. Together they slunk through the darkness, following the direction the dwarves had taken, heading north. Aided by the bright light of the two moons, Kang crept forward through the underbrush, followed by the seventy draconians of the second squadron. The draconians swept across the plain. They closed within five hundred feet of the village before a yell went out from the closest dwarven watchtower. Erlik, the commander of the second squadron, shouted his battle cry. It was echoed by the entire squadron. They charged. Unfortunately, the dwarves were waiting for them. Fifty poured out of the village, trying to intercept the draconians before they reached their objective. The second squadron hit the dwarves full force. The sounds of thumping and whacking, yells, cries, and curses in two languages were audible. The dwarves were taking the worst of it. The draconians were stopped cold, at least for no. It looked like they could use some help. Kang ordered the first squadron to attack. Cheering, they ran forward, yelling their battle cry. Even from this distance, Kang could see that the dwarves were starting. Many peered around, trying to determine the location of this new threat. Ehrlich's draconians took advantage of the dwarves' distraction and pushed ahead. But it was a reduced force. Fewer than 40 draconians from the second squadron were on the move. The rest were either fighting or lying on the ground, knocked out of the action. Suddenly, the night sky over Selabundan grew unusually magically bright. King recognized a Bozic light spell. He was up and away, heading for the dwarven village, his clawed feet tearing up the dry grass in the parched fields. When he reached the village, he discovered that the dwarves were holed up in the distillery storage shed. They had locked the doors to the shed and were threatening to dump their brew. By the Dark Queen's heart, Kang swore. The second squadron had surrounded the shed. The first squadron was holding the road to the center of town, where a large group of dwarves were assembling. Gloth came bounding up, red eyes blazing. Sir, they say they're going to dump it. That's right, came a gruff voice from the window of the storage shed. Come any closer and we pop the stoppers. I'm Thelmer, chief brewmaster, and as long as there's whiskers on my chin, I'll never again hand over my best brew to you lizard bastards. You've got to stop this, sir, Gloth cried in agony. I will, said Gang. Stand back. Lifting his hands, he formed the prescribed circles and slashes in the air and mumbled arcane words. A sudden flurry of activity could be heard inside the shed. A moment later, the dwarves burst out, running as fast as they could from the building. They were gasping and choking, had their noses and mouths covered with handkerchiefs. Several lurched to a halt, doubled over, and began to vomit. The draconians were already on the move. They charged inside the shed to restock with the kegs and claim their prize. But the first draconians who dashed in dashed out again almost as fast as the dwarves. Dude, that's a vile smell, Gloth snorted. Give them a minute, Kang said. The smell was already beginning to dissipate from the warehouse. Kang coughed and took a few steps upwind. Wrapping the kegs in their wounds, the draconians hurried back to the wagons. A few dwarves, the infuriated brewmaster Velmer among them, seemed inclined to give chase. But a grizzled, old, straight-backed graybeard, whom Kang recognized as the dwarves' war chief, called a halt at the tree line. Undoubtedly aware that more draconians were lying in ambush among the trees, the war chief decided to cut his losses. By his orders, two dwarves put a hammerlock on the cursing brewmaster and dragged him away, kicking and vowing to see all draconians roasting in Rearch's kitchen. Kang, dashing out of town, gave the war chief a salute. The war chief returned the salute with an obscene gesture, and thus ended another raid. Slith and his draconians trailed the dwarves far into the night. There was really no need to follow them. The dwarves weren't setting out to raid the draconian village, but Slith was now intensely curious. He heard snatches of the dwarves' conversation and had caught the dwarfen word for loot repeated several times. When the dwarves rounded a bend and moved out of Slith's sight, he motioned to Corporal Vrussover. I want you and the rest to go back and report to Commander Kang. Tell him I'll be away a few days, Slith ordered. The next night, after the dwarves made camp, Slith hid in the shadows, listening intently. He understood about one word in twenty. Slipped. Fell. Elefundus Ridge. Wind. Danger. More talk than Mineshaft. Thorburton. And tomorrow. Loot. Thorburton. 
So that was the plan. Slith pondered what to do. He needed food now. He would rest later, and he was alone in enemy territory. The Draconian decided to head for home. At least now Slith knew the answer to his questions. His curiosity was satisfied. As for opportunity, even though he'd come out of this trip empty-handed, the information he gained might prove valuable later. The four dwarves were up and moving before dawn. The difficult, treacherous part of the journey was behind them. They came across a well-traveled path, which led down the mountainside. No one except Selkvist had ever seen Thorbidin before. He was the food of legend and lore, most of it dished out with a bitter sauce. Now it was reality, and they could only imagine the wonders inside the mountain. Whole cities, bigger than Palampus, are built right inside, Mortar explained learnedly. And there's the life tree of Hylar, a gigantic stalactite that has 28 levels that house the central city of Thorbidin. You can reach the life tree by traveling in boats drawn by cables. Oh, give it a rest, will you, Selkvist said. It's a hole in the ground. That's all Thorbidin is and never will be. Quit jabbering. Come along. Shortly they came to a dead end. A rock wall lined with bushes whose long, spiky limbs were covered with very nasty-looking thorns blocked their way. This is it, Selkvist announced, looking extremely pleased with himself. What? asked Augur. The air hole, Selkvist said. Through there, behind those bushes. Why does it have to be there? Augur complained. Where else would it be? Sutton demanded. Some place easier to get to. Those thorns look sharp. They are sharp. Good thing, too. Why do you think this air hole has been so well hidden for so long? If the Thorbin and dwarves knew this was here, they would have plugged it up like they did all the others. But come on. The dwarves wrestled their way through the thorn bushes. Finally, shorn and scratched, hot and sweaty, and in no very good humor, they stood outside the air hole. Follow me. Selquist entered the air hole, with the others right behind. The air hole was actually a shaft poured into the side of the mountain. It was designed to provide air and light to those working below, and to use as an escape route during a cave-in. Hand and footholds were carved into the side of the smooth rock face of the shaft, as well as grapples on which to hang ropes. Selquist tied the end of his rope to the grapple, and the dwarves swung and climbed down the ropes. Welcome to Thorbidin, said Selquist, when they had all reached the bottom. After two hours of walking, the four dwarves reached the end of the mine shaft. Selquist flashed the lantern light all around. They were inside a large cavern. The light would not penetrate the darkness far enough to illuminate the ceiling. They could see the light shining on the iron rails, however, and those ran straight into a solid rock wall. This isn't what it looks like. This wall, Selquist tapped on it, was added at a later date, built right over the rails. Of course, Mortar interrupted. I know where we are. This must have been the very same tunnel used by the Thane of the Nidar to lead his people in their futile attempt to break into Thorbidin after the Hylar had refused them admittance following the Cataclysm. According to legend, the Thane and his clan crossed Helifundus Ridge, the same ridge we just crossed. This is a place of great historical significance, Mortar added. Hundreds of dwarves fought and died here. That would explain why the Council of Thanes had welled this area up, Pessel remarked. This area was a reminder of a dark time in Thorbidin history. They wanted it to disappear. You know, the dwarves must have had a forge down here. How else would they have repaired the rails, said Morden. And if they had a forge, they would have needed pipes to vent the heat, Pessel said eagerly. And if you ran the pipes into Thorbidin, Morden replied, you could use the heat from the forge to... Well, stop your yammering and come with me, Southwest interrupted. Raising his lantern, he flashed it over one of the largest forges the dwarves had ever seen illuminating the remnants of a system of large iron pipes that would vent the heat from the forge and carry it to the inhabited portions of Thorbidin. The iron had long since rusted and corroded, leaving scraps of pipe strewn across the tops of the forges. Selk was climbed up onto one of the enormous stone hearths, set his lantern down. From there, he grabbed onto a dangling chain and shinnied up it until he was opposite the hole. It was about as wide as he was tall. With the agility of a spider, the scrawny dwarf swung from the chain into the hole and disappeared. Come on, I'll help you, Selkwis called to his companions. Eventually, and with only minor difficulties, all four dwarves were crouched, safe and sound, inside the hole. Selkwis took the lead. The opening narrowed considerably, forcing the dwarves to drop to their hands and knees and crawl. When they reached the end, Selkwis removed several bolts from an iron grating and swung it open. Hurry, he whispered, and keep quiet. Selkwist held the grate while the other three exited. 